Praise the Lord. You're welcome to this session of this great convocation. I welcome you again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are still continuing on the three ties. We started yesterday and we are continuing today. The theme is still the transformation that must precede the translation. So far, we have introduced the meeting and I believe the Lord positioned us to maximize our benefit throughout the convocation. And we have looked at what imminence the translation of the saints now has. How soon, very soon, sooner than we can realize the translation of the saints is. We have also looked at another message talking about the transformation, the necessity of the transformation, why we all must be transformed because without it, none of us can see the Lord. It's an exigency. It's a can't do without. Today, or right now, we are looking at the nitty-gritty of the transformation, the details of the transformation, the details we need to pay attention to of the transformation. As is usual uh, with the Watchman Catholic Charismatic Renewal Movement, we want to edify our souls. We want to lift up our hearts to God in the inspiring songs that have been compiled, selected hymns and songs for Christian fellowship. We want to sing from number 29 and number 17. Hymn number 29, the old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. In the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. To the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. Each shame and reproach I will gladly bear. Then he will call me someday to my home far away. We are his glory forever I will share. So I cherish that old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown.
Jesus name let angels prostrate fall bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all crown him ye martyrs of our God who from his altar call extol the stem of Jesus rod and crown him Lord of all ye chosen seed of Israel's race ye ransom from the fall Hell him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Ye Gentile sinners, never forget the one wood and the girl. Go, spread your trophies at his feet, and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball, to him all majesty ascribe, and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng, we at his feet may fall. We will join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all.
we crown you the Lord of our lives, everlasting Father. We crown you he that died on the cross for us. We crown you the one that came down from heaven to seek us. We crown you Jehovah, the creator of the ends of the earth. We crown you, Lord of all. We crown you, Lord of our lives. We crown you, Lord of everything that pertains to us. We surrender ourselves and we give ourselves unto you from this hour. Jehovah, make out of us new creations indeed. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. But as we come before the word of truth, the law of liberty, we ask, dear Lord in heaven, that you recreate us, that you remold us. Jehovah, reformat us and make out of each and every one of us that thing that you have designed from the beginning of creation. Turn us around, blessed Redeemer, Amen. and cause our lives to give you pleasure. Amen. That everything about us, O oh God, will be to the glory of your majesty. Amen. Thank you for answering our prayers. Let there be practical realization of this miracle. Amen. And let there be testimonies everywhere in the world Amen. concerning the mighty hand of God upon our lives. Thank you because I know your answer. In Jesus' victorious name we pray. Amen. 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 We want to delve into the details, the integrity of the transformation that must precede the translation. Before us is the sub theme or subtopic of uh, this aspect of our three ties. We are looking at the new creation. The new creation. The details of what the Lord must do before the sins are taken away. What he must do in my life, what he must do in your life what he must achieve in the life of everyone that loves his or her life and would want to amount to something in eternity. Then you must pay attention to these details. You must apply our, your hearts to ensuring that these details are brought to bear upon your life. Praise the Lord. The new creation as one of the experiences that the Lord has determined to give to each and every one of us. Open your Bible to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, I want us to read from verse 15 to 23. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth bad fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. Have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out demons, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, 
I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1. And you has he quickened, who we are dead in trespasses and sins, in which in times past you walked, according to the curse of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our manner of life in time past, in the loss of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we are by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, had made us alive together with Christ. By grace you were saved. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. We are for remember. That ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, Ye who once were afar off are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments containing ordinances, to make in himself of two one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you who were afar off, and to them who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and sojourners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for an habitation of God through his spirit. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 14 to 21. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 21. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we are all dead. And that he died for all, that they who live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose again. We are for henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, 
and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Praise the Lord. The new creation. That is the first work that the Lord does in the life of any person that he would receive. He will make him a new creation. And uh, it is a foundational work upon which every other work of grace in the life of an individual is built. Without this foundation, there is nothing that can be established in any life in terms of the works of grace. This foundational experience is very, very necessary that every one of us should check out that we possess the experience. Because in this last lap of the church age, we witness a lot of religion and a lot of religious activities with little or nothing of Christ to show for it. We are in a generation where multitudes fill the churches. And the, the churches are overflowing. At every street, you find 10 or more churches in the cities of Nigeria and all over the world. And the multitudes are filling the places. In fact, many people have been in churches for upward of 30, 40, 50 years. But their lives remain unchanged. They are still the same very old people that they have been. But they have occupied offices, they have occupied positions in churches. And the multitudes fill the places that in a number of churches, they run up to seven services every Sunday. The places are filled with human beings. And they come and sing and dance and they, you know, make merry. They listen to the word of God. They are happy. They, they say they are a Bible church. They say they are, they are charismatic. They say a number of things about their names. But when you come close to them, you encounter somebody other than a Christian. In spite of all this, it is very difficult. When you meet people on the streets, it's very difficult to encounter genuine children of God in the midst of the timid multitudes in churches. When you have some dealings with them, you will understand the very truth of what I am talking about. Very many people believe in Christ. They believe unto healing, healing of their bodies. Many believe unto a number of miracles, miracles of provisions, miracles of prosperity in material and in financial matters. But very few are Christians like Christ. Remember that the word Christian was a nickname given to a community of believers in Christ. When the people that were not part of them observed them closely and they have heard about Christ, how he lived his life and how things about him went. By the time Jesus had died and gone, they were observing these people and they were matching the observations with what they heard about Christ. And they said, these people are like Christ, Christians. It was a nickname. Today, it is the other way. Many people have not believed true to the saving of their souls from sin. 
But they have believed in Christ to a number of things in their lives. There are believers that feel everywhere. Even many of those that don't come to church. Many believe. And unfortunately or you know, astonishingly, even Satan believes. The Bible said even Satan believes in God and he trembles. So it is not news. It's not something wonderful when you say, I am a believer. I am a believer. Jesus did not commission the apostles and disciples to go and make believers of uh, the nations. No. It was uh, his instruction that they should go into all the world and make disciples of all the people. But very few people are disciples of Christ in our generation. Many believe in him and they have many things to show. Many have a fleet of cars to show that they believe in Christ. They practice titan and they have miracles and testimonies to that effect. Very many people believe because they have been healed of diverse sicknesses. A number of things that uh, they talk about that show them that uh, they believe in Christ. But God enjoins us to believe through to the saving of our souls from sin. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 and verse 39, the Bible says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. But we are of them that believe through to the saving of the soul. We are not of them that draw back. They believe and they draw back. They stop halfway. They stop somewhere. We are of them that believe through to the saving of the soul. It takes just the strokes of the cane that came upon the body of Jesus to settle all your sicknesses and diseases. But it took him to bleed and die before your sins could be settled. So when you are believing and you are believing to the healing of your body, you are still halfway, you are still far. Move on to the saving of your soul. Believe on. And when you do, then your journey begins. The Bible says he told those Jews in John chapter 8, who believed on him, he told them saying, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. So, multitudes of children, of youths, and adults that are very zealous in church, they sing in choir, they pray hard prayers, they preach wonderfully, but they are under the power of demons. I am sorry to say that people in church should be under the power of the Holy Spirit. But unfortunately, in the church that we find in our generation, there are two principal demons that influence life in very many people in the, in the church. Two principalities. One, the prince of the power of the air. Two, the queen of heaven. These two principalities influence life in today's church more than the Holy Spirit does. And that is the reason the places are filled with people that are far from Christ, far from heaven. That is the reason the churches are beaming with booming with uh, multitudes, but few have their names written in the book of life because they are still under the power of these two principal demons. The demon, the principality called the queen of heaven, is in charge of religion. She is in charge of uh, religiosity. So all the, the religious, uh, you know, uh, uh, passion that people exhibit, 
all the religious, uh, you know, desires and interests and even fanaticism that people exhibit. Many of them are direct influences of uh, the queen of heaven. Many of the tongues you hear people speak. Many of the prophecies you hear people give. Many of the trances and the revelations that you, you, you hear in their testimonies. Many emanate from the queen of heaven. Then they make them religious. That principality makes them full of religion, full of uh, religious observances. Just use your mind to check the level of religious activities that go on around you in the place where you come from. And then you will discover if those multitudes were actually of Christ, the world would be a different place today. The second principality that you find at work in multitudes of people in church is called the prince of the power of the air. This is the, the demon spirit that is in charge of every form of rebellion. He's in charge of every form of disobedience. And so, when you see people in church, they are full of religion, but they are full of disobedience. They are simply under the power of these two spirits. Religious spirit, the queen of heaven, and the spirit of disobedience, the prince of the power of the earth. He is ruling their lives, he is controlling, he is influencing them. Yet they come to church. Yet they, they are full of religious activities. They are full of prayers. They make many prayers, endless prayers. But their lives tell nothing about Christianity. So, today, outright sinners that are not interested in church things, they have only one spirit that is ruling their lives. Why those that come to church, many of them are under two spirits. The ones that are outright sinners that don't come to church, that are not interested in church activities, is only the prince of the power of the air that is ruling their lives. The children of disobedience come under that power. They come under the influence of that spirit. The stubbornness that you find everywhere, the wickedness that you see, the blood thirst that you find in the lives of people, the violence that they manifest, these are all from the prince of the power of the air. The Bible says that is what made us children of wrath, just like others. All the violent spirit, all the, all the anger that people manifest that is from that uh, demon spirit. Because we are in the last day, the day of the Lord proper, and uh, the translation of the saints is around the corner. The Lord has determined to change this narrative. Amen. He has determined to change the situation that we find in our today's church. He has determined to bring out for himself a new creation. A people of his own from the multitudes that mill around in the churches. He also has determined to do the same from the multitudes that mill around from outside the churches, the ones that don't have anything to do, do with church. Sunday mornings, you find them in the streets playing football. Sunday mornings, you find them at corners drinking and chatting and doing a lot of things. They're not interested in church. They have been going to church and coming and nothing happened in their lives. So they dropped going. But the Lord has a plan for them. Amen. He has a plan for those in church. He has a plan for those outside the church. Now, what is the Lord's program to bring new creations out of these multitudes? Now, the prince of the power of the air is always contending with the spirit of Christ, the spirit of holiness, as to who will rule the lives of people. None of these spirits, whether the spirit of Christ or the spirit of uh, the prince of the power of the air, none of them has the authority to force us into doing what we don't want to do. Because God created us to be like him, to have the power to choose what to do and what not to do. 
and the power even to change our minds. When we say we want to do this at this point, and later we can change our mind to say we won't do that again. That is the nature of God. And that is that nature that he passed over unto us, his creatures, human beings. So, the spirit of holiness, the spirit of Christ, cannot force himself on us. Neither can the spirit of the prince of the power of the air force himself on us. We must willingly yield ourselves to obey which of them we choose to obey. And we thus become the servant of that spirit. Romans chapter 6. When we choose to obey any of those spirits, we become the servant of that spirit. When you find any religious person very, very zealous in religious activities, but his life is not in tune with the righteousness of God, the person that is, uh, that is producing that religiosity is the queen of heaven, not the spirit of Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 16 Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his slaves you are whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that whereas you were the servants or the slaves of sin, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. You became the slaves of righteousness. So you are either a slave of the prince of the power of the air, or you are a slave of the spirit of holiness, the spirit of Christ. It is therefore our duty to choose who we obey and who we should fight against. There are two kingdoms that are contending for your soul and for my soul. Those two kingdoms are fighting to control your life. They are fighting to um, engage you into their own side. But none has the authority of God to force you. You must yield yourself. You must accept to obey the one that will eventually win to control your life. It is, if you choose to obey Christ, then you have uh, invariably positioned yourself to, to fight the prince of the power of the air. And if, on the other hand, you choose to obey the prince of the power of the air, you have invariably Position yourself to fight against Christ. It is one against the other. If we had earlier chosen to disobey God, like Adam and Eve chose to do, if any person is in the habit of living contrary to the word of God, disobeying the Lord, there is also an opportunity to change the mind. If we have come under the mystery of iniquity, under the influence and authority of the prince of the power of the air, we can still change our minds today. Because we have wills of our own. And when we change our mind, we now engage ourselves to fight the spirit of lawlessness and come under the spirit of holiness. The whole thing is by choice. It is simply by choice. Now, to achieve this status of aligning yourself with the spirit of holiness, the spirit of Christ, and fighting and overcoming the spirit of lawlessness, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is in charge of the lives of the children of disobedience, 
The spirit that makes people children of wrath. The spirit that makes people enemies of God. If you want to fight and win the battle over him, and you want to be on the Lord's side and be a new creation, there are certain things you will do, and you will be recreated. And when you are recreated, you will be repositioned to live your life the way it will please God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Number one, you will have to open your heart to the word of God. You cannot receive recreation of life. You cannot receive the spirit of Christ. Without the word of God. You are made new. You are recreated. You are a child of God. Through the agency of the word of God. And not through any other means. At all, at all. In Ephesians chapter 5. In verse 25, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the world, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Christ said to sanctify and cleanse the church by washing it with the word of God or washing her with the word of God. In First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 22 to 25, seeing that you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible, by what? The word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is like grass, and all the glory of man like the flower of grass, the grass withered and its flower falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is that word which by the gospel is preached unto you. That word that begets you, that makes you a child of God, that recreates you and makes you a new creation, is that word which by the gospel is preached unto you. You, you may have some natural tendency in your life to do some good things. You may have uh, some, you know, genetic endowment from your forebears, from your parents and uh, grandparents to have some soft mind, to have some good nature to help the needy and all that. It doesn't make you a child of God. Cornelius was one such man. The Bible said he feared God. The fear of God is not the same thing as being born again. It's not the same thing as being a new creation. The devil fears God and trembles. The devil, the moment you, you mention the name of Jesus, he begins to, you know, tremble. He fears. Of course, any, any person that is reasonable should be afraid of the person that he knows is stronger than him. So, it's not the fear of God that is in question here. It is the new creation. Are you recreated? Are you a child of God? Are you still your old self? Or are you a new person? Are you now new? Have you been recreated by the word of God? So, Cornelius was told by an angel, 
You are good works. You are good deeds. You are arms. All your prayers, they have ascended to God and they are a monument before him. But he has looked at your life. He has considered everything put together. He has seen that you are not yet saved. You need salvation. Now send for Peter. He is lodging with one Simon Etana in the city of Joppa. And he will come and tell you words by which you and your household shall be saved. Salvation is through words. The word of God. It is not through any other means. If you must be saved, you must have heard the word of God and responded to it. That word will work out the purpose of God in your life. In the book of uh, Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 4. The word of God in verse 12 is living. It is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. And of the joints and marrows. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The word of God is quick. It is living. It is uh, powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. The spirit is that part of God that was uh, breathed into man and he became a living soul. So the spirit is, is possessing the nature of God. It came from God. The soul is the consciousness, the seat of consciousness of the individual. It is the soul that enables the spirit to relate with the physical world through the flesh. Huh? Now, when the soul is... Housing the spirit. Both the spirit housed by the soul, they enter the physical body as a house and live there. And then that physical body can walk around and talk and do many things as a living human being. That is how man is a tripartite being, just like God is a trinity. Now, from the physical world, information, impulses come to the physical body. The sense organs of the body pick these impulses. But it is the soul that interpret these impulses so that the spirit can take decision concerning those pieces of information or impulses. If the flesh has become dismembered, it is dead. Those impulses cannot be received. Whether it is sound, whether it is light, whether it is any other information or impulse from the environment, the body has to be alive to receive those impulses. The sense organs have to receive them. It is the soul, the seat of consciousness, the seat of volition, the will. That is the thing that interprets these impulses in the light of the knowledge it possesses. And it will interpret them as right or wrong. Will interpret them as acceptable or not. If it is acceptable, for instance, the, there are some chemicals in the air that has entered into the nostrils. And the person, those chemicals were received and the brain has, you know, interpreted them to be, oh, very fine aroma of uh, a very pleasant uh, dish to eat. 
Huh? The soul will interpret the something and desire it or not desire it. Take for instance, if it is, uh, you know, an aroma of uh, jollof rice, and the person that has received that uh, stimulus is diabetic and he knows it. The soul will interpret and say, though this thing is so inviting, but it's not for you. So, we need to understand that God, in his infinite mercy, has uh, given us these three aspects of our being to coordinate, but all of them are under the spirit. The spirit is the chief, and he takes the last decision. Now, if that spirit is linked to God, the life of God will be flowing to it, and the strength to resist anything contrary will fill it to overflowing. So when impulses come from outside, the soul will want it, but the spirit said, no, this is not acceptable. And then immediately it will be dismissed. Another impulse will come. The spirit will, you know, because it is in union with the spirit of God, it will see that one and say, this one is acceptable. You can, you can bring it, you can bring it. Now, because it is in charge, it takes the final decision. And then the body will do it. That is why at the last count, the body has just done its own part. It will return to the earth from where it was taken. The spirit will now return to God to give account all the decisions he took in the body. To give account of everything that he did. Because when, when a human being is taking an action on anything, it is as much as the spirit allows him to take. When the spirit becomes cut off from God, there is no more strength, no more, no more life coming from there. When these impulses come from, from the outside, for instance, a young man is going about and a beautiful lady just walks across. The, the eyes receive the impulse. And then it's interpreted. The soul will look at it. Oh, wonderful, pretty girl. This one is wonderful. This one will be so, so great if he's taken to bed. Now, if the spirit was in connection with God, it will say, no, you don't do that. You don't look at her the second time. This is not your wife. This is a strange woman. And so the person would walk away. But if the life of God is not connected to the spirit of that person, he will accept the, the, the suggestion of the soul. He will accept the things that have been brought. And so this, this will be great. Or this will be wonderful. He begins to consider it. That is why the Bible says, when sin comes as a, a temptation. The thing is not done until the person begins to ruminate over it. In James chapter 1, he says, Let no man say, verse 13, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Somebody is drawn away and is enticed. But then you have to conceive it. It brings sin. And when sin is finished, it brings forth death. So, this is the situation that human beings on earth find themselves. The spirit is struggling. If there is no life from God, no connection, the spirit will be overcome. He can struggle and struggle and struggle with the little thing left in him. But if he succumbs, when he succumbs and commits the sin the first time, the second time the temptation is coming, it will not struggle as much as the first time. 
The next time, it will just be for the asking. The next moment, he will be the person looking for it. But the Bible says, when the situation is like this, the spirit now comes into complete union and conformity with the soul. And the interpretation of right or wrong, or do and don't, will now depend on the environment. What the environment says, what the people are saying, what they frown about, and things like that. If they are interested in the story of how many girlfriends you have, then that, that is what the spirit will be talking about. But in such a situation, somebody is telling lies and uh, is the order of the day. He is proud of telling lies because he is getting some benefit from it. Somebody is, uh, you know, manifesting a lot of anger. And he's even giving testimonies about it. He said, go and ask about me. I, know I don't tolerate nonsense. Go and ask about me. I, he's he's uh, talking about it as though he is, uh, he is, uh, it is a virtue to be angry. Look, you, they don't mess up with me at all. Go and ask them. And then the person is going on like that. Until a day comes like today. When that individual hears the word of God. And for the first time, the word of God exposes those things he has been doing. For which he has been proud sometimes. For which he has been even testifying sometimes. Now exposes them as hateful and hurtful to God. Exposes those things as Things that will make that person to be damaged permanently in eternity. And he doesn't want to be damaged. He doesn't want to die. He doesn't want to go to hell. But the word of God now brings to the person's heart the reality of the kind of life he is living. The Bible says his soul and his spirit will be separated. He will be separated and the spirit for the first time since he got so united with the soul and is carried away by every suggestion it is making, the spirit now kind of draws back and looks at how dirty the soul is. Looks at how nasty his life has been. And the word of God that has come to break that, that, uh, that uh, union or that solidarity is coming from God. Is linking the spirit back to God. And he now has conviction that he has, he has so much degenerated from the glory of God and is now in a very big mess. That is the time. Somebody for the first time will abhor himself. For the first time, he will recognize that he has been a sinner. Sometimes he will so much... Be sorry for himself and for his life that you begin to weep. Nobody flogged him. Nobody flogged her. But the word of God separated the spirit and the soul. And the spirit back to God will look at the state of the soul as horrible. As not acceptable. And he will begin to cry. That's the first step. If the word of God does not do that in the life of any person. That word could be from a track you read. That word could be from a, a videotape you listen to. That word could be from the Bible you read. It could be from a ministration from the pulpit as uh, you are hearing it now. It could be from somebody, even a mad person, can say something and the word of God will fly and hit your heart. Separate your spirit from your soul. And your spirit will look at the soul as it is lost, dirty, wretched. Then it will cry out for help. Because Jesus Christ has been hovering around the door of our hearts. Knocking and you know, desiring to come in to deliver us. But because we have not opened up, he cannot force himself in. When the word of God does this feat, when it achieves this great feat, and our hearts are opened, we now cry out, we ask for help. By that time, we ask for help. We say, God, help me. Deliver me. Jesus, help me. By the time you cry out, he will come in. 
And when he comes in, because you have examined your life and you have seen the image you are carrying is not the image of Christ. This is not the image of God. This is not holiness. It's not righteousness. This is filthiness. This is a terrible abomination, iniquity. And you don't want to be associated with that. You cry out. And then that leads to the second thing, repentance from sin. If you are not convicted of sin, you cannot repent of it. It is the word of God that does the first work, then your own decision comes in now. You now decide, I want to turn away from this kind of thing. I don't want to continue. I can't continue in this. That's repentance from sin in our lives. And they return to God for forgiveness and cleansing. When, this, when somebody does this, he now invites Christ, the spirit of Christ, the spirit of holiness, to come into his life that he may be recreated. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Listen to me. The person that is born after this encounter is not the person that was before the encounter. When a new baby is born, the baby is a product of uh, the seed of the father and the, and the egg of the mother. Am I right? Yes, now, when that baby is born, you cannot say this baby is his father. Neither can you say this baby is his mother. But the baby is a brand new person, a unique individual. That is how it is. When the spirit of man from this encounter with the word of God takes a decision to have Christ to come and rule in his life, Jesus by his spirit will come in and unite himself with the spirit of the man and produces a new creation. When this person, the spirit that was weak before, the spirit that was yielding to whatever the flesh was talking about, when it receives this quickening from the word of God, when it has this experience we have just described, and he now cries out and asks for grace and asks for help, the spirit of Christ will enter in and unite with his spirit and produce a new individual. If his name was John, he's no more John. But that spirit is that entered is the spirit of Christ. But you cannot say it is Jesus. So this is now a, a product of John and Jesus. So you can call him John Jesus. That is the new creation. That's the person that is recreated. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 16 and 17. What? Know ye not that he who is joined to an harlot is one body with the harlot? For two, said he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. He that is joined unto the Lord, the spirit of the Lord and his spirit have joined, is now one. That's a new creation. That's why 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. It is only on this miracle, it is only on this experience that old things can pass away. If it didn't happen, then the person may have just a renewed interest in the things of God. But his life can still remain where it is. But when somebody has had this encounter by the word of God, he has had this separation of the spirit and the soul, he has seen himself in all of his dirtiness and in all of his, the, 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 the soul that has been soiled. And he cries out. And Christ comes in and does the miracle of recreation. The miracle of regeneration. That is what is called being born again. 
When somebody has that experience, old things will pass away. His value system will change. The things that uh, meant something for, for the person before, all the fanciful things of this life, you are pursuing this and pursuing that, they will no longer be like that. The things that God hallows, he begins to hallow. The things that God hates, he will begin to hate. The things that God despises, he will begin to despise. Why? Because the spirit of holiness has joined with his own spirit to produce one new person. Just like the seed of the man joined with the egg of the woman to produce a new child. That's a new creation. Praise the Lord. Now, when this happens, you move forward and discover any undue influence of the prince of the power of the air in your life. You reject them. You begin to check, are there besetting sins, are there habits that have formed over the years that I effortlessly, without thought, engage in? When you look at these sins that beset you, you then begin to walk to free yourself from them. You reject them and expose them, report them to God. The new person in charge of your life now. The person you have reconnected to. You report to him and uh, he will deliver you from the power that uh, has been loading it over you. That is, uh, we will look at it later in uh, the other segments of uh, the details of the transformation. So when you come to this point, there are little, little things that may look like they don't matter but they will help you enormously to live the life that will be pleasing to God. You will refuse the company, the friendship, and the influence of those who have refused the lordship of Jesus in their lives. After you have had this experience, after you have searched your own life and you have got rid of things that can draw you back, the habits and the, all the things that... Uh, that are weighing you down, the sins that easily beset you, you give them up, you report them, and the Lord takes them away from your life. And you are now a bouncing baby boy or baby girl in the Lord. Amen. The Bible says, as newborn babes, you desire the sincere milk of the word of God, that you may grow thereby. Now, as you are now growing, God enjoins you to refuse the company of those that have refused the lordship of Jesus in their life. Refuse their friendship. Refuse their influence. Because if you don't do that, they will eventually draw you back to sin and eventually to death. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. Be not deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. In Hebrews chapter 10, we have read it 38 and 39. He says, we are not of them that draw back. If any man draws back, he says, my soul shall not have any pleasure in him. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, we read the story of Amnon, the very handsome son of David. How his friend, Jonadab, aided him to rape his own sister. And in the process, brought untold troubles and trauma upon his life, upon the house of David, upon the entire family. But it was a friend, Jonadab, that lured him, that said, look at you, you are pining away. Let me advise you what to do. And he gave him, you know, the wicked counsel from the pit of hell. And he took it. 
he succeeded, but then he paid with his life. It was just a short while he was murdered. And the murder was visited upon the entire house. So we need to understand that as newborn babes, you don't play with many, many things that, that can harm you. Then, lastly, you open your heart and develop interest in the word of God. Develop interest in prayers to be able to be a daily overcomer. To be able to be a daily winner over all the influences of the evil spirits. When you have broken loose from the prince of the power of the air, the spirit in charge of every disobedience, every stubbornness, every anger, fitful anger, rot, that's the spirit in charge of all those uh, lifestyles. When you are free by this process of recreation and you have become a new creation, don't ever think that that spirit will just say, okay, bye-bye, you can go. No. No. He would want to bring you back. Jesus Christ said, when an evil spirit is cast out of a man, he will go about wandering and finding no place to enter and rest like he was resting in that man. He will say, let me go back and check from the house that I was chased from. Said if he comes around and discovers that it is uh, open, it is empty, he will go and bring seven other demons more wicked than him, and they will come back to occupy. But when he comes and discovers that the new master there is uh, Jesus Christ, the one he dreads, then it will begin to fight from without. And as long as your relationship with Christ is intact, his fight will be in vain. Amen. You will remain in that state of uh, being a child of God, being a new creation, and continuing in the life that Jesus Christ gives. The life flows from God, flows into the individual where Jesus has united with his spirit. And that life is called Zoe, eternal life. When eternal life is flowing in the life of an individual, the things he will be doing, the life he will be living will not be the normal, usual life of the people around in the world. It will be a strange kind of life. It will be a life that transcends the ordinary. It will be a life that is not common among men. A life where somebody offended you. He didn't come for, for forgiveness. He didn't ask you, please forgive me. You have already forgiven. And when people are expecting that uh, now he has come to your corner, you are going to hit him hard, you will now do him good. They will be looking at you, this person is mumu number one. This person is Mugu. I have never seen this kind of person before. The difference is that the life you are living is not an earthly life. It's not the life that is found here in the world. It is the life of heaven. It is Zoe. Jesus Christ said, I have come to give them Zoe. To give them life. To give it to them more abundantly. That life is God's kind of life. And God's kind of life is a, a flow of love. God's kind of life is a flow of forgiveness. God's kind of love is a flow of compassion. God's kind of love is a flow of tender mercies, brotherly kindness. These are the things that emanate from the life of God. And when somebody has received it, that individual will be a slave of righteousness. That's what we read in Romans chapter 6. He says, the person you yield yourself to obey, you become his slave. So, when you have come to this point, and you have yielded yourself to obey Jesus Christ, the word of God, you have yielded yourself to be in union with his spirit, the spirit of holiness. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, if any person whether he calls himself or herself a Christian or not, doesn't have the spirit of Christ. 
It doesn't belong to him. But when you have passed through this process and you have gotten the spirit of Christ, unite with your own spirit, then you have gotten Zoe. You have gotten the life of God. You have gotten the new life. You have gotten eternal life. You have gotten a life that the devils cannot conquer. You have gotten a life that the world cannot pollute. You have gotten a life that the powers of darkness have no stranglehold upon. You will be victorious. You will be more than conquerors. You will, you will live above sin. Sin shall no more have dominion over you. The person whose life is inside you was victorious over sin from the first day on earth till the last day. So he brings his victory into your life. The life he brought is the life of victory over sin. So when people are saying that in being in this world, you cannot live a life above sin, they have not gotten this encounter. This experience has not been in their lives. I got that experience in 1981 in the month of November, 40 years ago. And that experience has kept me. That experience has been with me in the day and in the night. That experience has been the secret behind anything that my life manifests. Without that experience, you may try hard, but you will not be able. Because the devil is stronger than you. Without God's spirit, you can't match him. He has been in the world for over 6,000 years and has gathered experience of dealing with human beings. But you are not yet 90 years. How can you match the experience of Satan? How can you match his wisdom? How can you match his uh, strategies? But with Christ in you, the person that created that very you know, being, with him in you, the wisdom per excellence will be given you. And you will be able to counter every effort that the devil makes to lure you to sin. That is the new creation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. This is the process of becoming a new creation. It does not happen any other way. It doesn't happen because you are baptized. Baptism is simply an outward show to the world that you have been dead and buried with Christ. Because if they bury you in the sand, before they finish and come up, you will die. That's why they choose a burial ground like, like water, where you can dip, completely buried, and can come up, because it's a symbolic thing, and yet will be alive. That's why baptism, you know, is done. To show that you are, you are dead to the world. You are dead to sin. You are dead to Satan. You are dead to yourself. And because you are dead to the people you were married before, you are now free to marry Christ. And now that death has separated you from your former master and your marriage partner, you are now free to marry Christ and he becomes your new Lord and your master. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. It is your prerogative. It is your choice. When you decide, no power can say no to you. God is behind your decision. If you say today, I want to call it quits with sin. I have heard the word of God. I have understood it very well. I want to apply my heart to it. Lord, I want to be a new creation. Who among you is saying like that? Who among you is saying, Lord, I yield myself unto you. I want to be a new creation. Let the transformation begin. Let it begin in my life right now. Stand upon your feet and talk to the Lord. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. 
You can become a new creation today. All of your masturbation can end. If you join yourself with the Lord, the Spirit of Christ joins your spirit. You become one with him. The power of God will be inside you. Jesus is the power of God. The wisdom of God will be with you. Jesus is the wisdom of God. The glory of God will be inside you. Jesus is the very manifestation of his glory. Call upon the Lord. It is possible you have been many years in the church, but you've not had this experience. You've not had this encounter. You have not had this recreation of your life to become a new creation. You have the opportunity with you now. This is the only way out of sin. This is the only way to be victorious in this life. Examine yourself. Whose image are you? Whose fruit are you bearing? Is it the fruit of righteousness or the fruit of sin? He that committed sin is of the devil. But he that is righteous is righteous. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as Christ is. Call upon the Lord. Let the power of his name walk in your life now. Let the spirit of uh, holiness Unite with your spirit as you repent of your sins and invite him into your life. The experience will be yours. And you will testify that it is possible to be in this wicked world and yet not be under the power of sin. Let the glory of God come upon your life. Allow the word of God enter into you. All the habits, the besetting sins, they can be broken. You can be free. Yes, you can. That's why Jesus came to seek and to save those that were lost. God's kind of life can be made manifest in you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. If you are there, you may have come for the first time, you were invited to this convocation, and the Lord has opened your eyes to see that there is a possibility of getting out of your sin, a possibility of overcoming and becoming a new creation. You have understood the process outlined, and you want to make a commitment to Christ to have this experience, to have him enter your life and unite with your spirit and bring out of you a brand new person. Place your right hand on your chest. And we will pray on the understanding that you have from the depth of your heart opened yourself unto the Lord and saying, Lord, have your way in me.
I have harmed myself. I see that I've been carrying the image of Satan, the image of sin. But I want to be a new creation. I want to have a new life. I want to have a new, a new beginning. Almighty and everlasting Father, behold the man, behold the woman. Behold the boy, behold the girl. As many everlasting Father, as have opened their hearts and have recognized the evil of their doings. They have recognized, Lord, the nature of sin that had taken the upper hand in their lives. And they recognize that for these sins, Jesus died. And it was for these sins that he was sent to hell. He was separated from God, being cut off on that day because he became sin for us. And he died physically. And the Bible says he descended into hell. He went into the lower parts of the earth. There he suffered for the sins of these my beloved brethren. And for the sins of the entire world. Father in heaven. Let that victorious suffering and death that Jesus Christ undertook on our behalf. Begin to speak in their lives now. Amen. Father. Because he has died. In the record of God, these ones have died for those sins. Because the Bible says, if he died for all, it means that all have died. Therefore, you have, Lord, a place justified to forgive them. Because the full penalty for all their sins have been paid, fully paid. Let the mercy of the Lord therefore come upon their lives. Yeah. Father, show them mercy. Yeah. Mercy rejoices over justice. Yeah. Father, show them mercy. Yeah. Lord, cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Yeah. Forgive them all their numerous iniquities. Yeah. And Father, I pray, remove their names from the book of condemnation and death. Yeah. And uh, engrave their names in the book of life. Yeah. Father, from this day, let the spirit of holiness remain with their own spirit, united, joined together to be one. And let them be a brand new person. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, from this day, let them experience the victory that Calvary gives. Let them experience victory over sin. Let them experience victory over Satan. Let them experience victory over every temptation that will come their way. Let them experience victory over self. In the name of Jesus Christ. Let the power of your majesty, O righteous father, descend into their lives. And let Zoe begin to manifest in them. For Jesus Christ said he will give us life, Zoe, and give it to us more abundantly. Let it be more abundantly in the name of Jesus. Amen. Whereas before their neighbors never knew them as children of God. By what they will begin to see. By the changes in their lives. By the testimonies of a changed life. Blessed Redeemer. They will know that Jesus is indeed alive. Amen. And that every word that is in the word of God, the Bible is true, and that it works wonders. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, everlasting Redeemer. Let your right hand of power rest upon these ones, and let their testimonies flow unhindered on daily basis. In Jesus' victorious name we pray. And amen.